hi friends uh, and co-authors. Thank you for taking, taking some time to um, meet and chat today about our brief leveraging promising practices, uh, improving the recruitment, hiring and retention of diverse and inclusive faculty. Um, I think it might be helpful for us to start off with some quick introductions. Uh, Kimberly, sure. would you like to go first? Um, hi, everybody. My name is Kimberly Griffin. I'm a faculty member at the University of Maryland College Park in the Higher Education, Student Affairs, and International Education Policy Program. Um, I'm also Associate Dean for Graduate Education and Faculty Affairs for the College of Education. And I have had the pleasure of working with the Aspire Project in two roles. Um, first, I'm co-PI of the research team and get to work with Leslie Gonzalez on thinking about how we study how institutions make change and how they start thinking about increasing faculty diversity and how they work together in a network to do that. And secondly, I get to work with the iChange project as one of the iChange coordinators, helping institutions um, engage in their work and assess their campus's capacity for change. I'm Jess Bennett. I am the assistant director for STEM education at the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. And I also am the project manager for the Aspire Alliance iChange network. And I'm Travis York, the Assistant Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs at the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. I also serve as co-lead of the Institutional Change Initiative, uh, where I work with Jess and our co-lead, Tanya Peoples. And uh, I also serve as co-lead of our backbone for the Alliance. So the three of us uh, have worked on this brief, which is really targeted uh, towards college and university administrators uh, seeking to recruit, hire, and retain diverse and inclusive faculty Kimberly, I'm, I'm wondering if you can share with us the, the origins of this work. And then Jess, I'm wondering if you might also be able to share with us about the, the evolution um, of that work into this brief. Sure. Um, so as I've done my work as a faculty member, I think a lot about inclusion, equity, increasing diversity in graduate education and the professoriate. And every time I meet with institutional leaders or with campuses to start talking about change, there's two questions that we always get asked. Um, the first is, can you tell me what the promising or best practices are? And second, um, who says they work? And can you tell me more about the literature that would show that these are indeed the things that we should be doing? So in order to help institutions make progress and, and move down the path towards increasing um, diversity on their campuses, we tried to do the heavy lifting of going through the literature. Um, so this brief is based on um, a larger and longer document um, that's a review of the literature, really looking at the barriers and the challenges that women and men of color in the academy face, and what we know about strategies that seem to help promote change and help institutions move towards transformation and increasing their diversity. And we consolidated it down to a shorter brief um, that's hopefully more user-friendly. Yeah, so um, what Kimberly didn't really share is that the foundation of her longer literature review is also the foundation of the work we do in the iChange network. And so she has created and developed a model, and that model really helps ground everything we're doing with the iChange network. Um, and so we really wanted to be able to get people hooked into the literature backing the model. It's a question we get all the time. Where did this come from? How is this working? But we also know that institutional leaders are busy. Um, they're not gonna sit down and read necessarily an extensive literature review on a topic. Um, and we also know, noted that a lot of these interventions that are really promising, they touch on lots of different parts of our model. They help with retention, they help with satisfaction, they help with um, recruiting people to the campus. And so it starts getting really messy to simply talk about, about all of these different promising practices. And we'd also been beginning to think about in the broader iChange network about how can we really ensure change is happening in a holistic way. A lot of times we just wanna pick a single strategy off the tree of promising practices and we think that'll solve everything when really changes need to happen across a lot of different dimensions. And so we're really excited to take Kimberly's much longer, extensive and really thoughtful review of the literature and, and condense it down into something much more manageable. And to do that, we borrowed um, and incorporated the Center for Gender and Organizations from Sim Simmons University's um, four frames for inclusive organizations. And that really helped us be able to kind of match these promising practices along these four frames and help ensure that leaders are thinking holistically, that they're not just fixing an individual and providing them the kinds of changes they need to make, that we're not just um, 
you know, kind of putting in some policies and practices and hoping things change, that we're also really thinking about the values of our organizations and really digging deeply into examining why we do what we do, why do we value what we value, how does our culture show up in the, in the localities. So you'll find the literature is kind of organized among those dimensions so that institutions don't just implement a single strategy or within a single frame and, and think that they've accomplished it all. And Kimberly, that larger uh, piece that you were referencing, that the chapter is a, um, a chapter in the Handbook of Higher Education. Yes, it is. Um, a chapter in, I believe the formal title of the text is Higher Education, a Handbook of Theory and Research. Um, and it is a longer comprehensive literature review that really offers the scholarly foundation, the theoretical foundations for the framework that guides our work in I Change. So really helps us understand the multi-dimensional nature of the challenges that women and men of color in the academy face and the multiple touch points that an institution really has to think about if they're going to go in and try to make changes. That it isn't, um, there's no one solution that they ultimately could go in and implement that would transform everything. That they really have to be mindful and intentional about thinking about how are the changes they're making translate to more effectively recruiting a more diverse body of individuals to their faculty. How are they really being intentional about how they onboard those faculty members and then how are they thinking about retention in a holistic way, not only navigating the tenure and promotion process, but whether or not they feel included, whether or not they feel welcome in an environment and they want to continue to stay yeah. there. And so for anybody watching that hears us uh, reference I change, the t term the three of us use often because of our work, um, I change or institutional change is short for a, a network of universities um, engaged in seeking to diversify and build a more inclusive STEM faculty. And that's part of a broader NSF funded includes alliance um, called Aspire, the Aspire Alliance. Many institutional leaders are aware that structural diversity of their faculty does not mirror the student body or the region, or they just want to know, how do I fix it? How do I fix these issues? But are there important questions or pre-work that you really think institutions should be doing and considering before they jump into just implementing strategies? I think that we actually see this quite a bit um, when, we, when we think about institutional change, um, not just institutional change to um, be more effective in, in building, our, uh, building inclusive in, uh, institutions, but in, in issues of institutional change, we oftentimes see that institutional leaders may become aware of a problem. Uh, in this case, they may, may be very, very aware that their current faculty do not even uh, mirror the structural diversity of the students they serve um, or of the regions in which they're seeking to, to serve. And, and um, it's often the case that uh, we see institutional leaders fall into what we call a change trap. Uh, and, and that change trap is that they go from awareness into implementation. I just kind of referenced this earlier. Uh, and it's quite common. Um, we see this oftentimes happening. And, and in fact, um, when we see institutional leaders become aware of a problem and they start to uh, pick strategies to implement, um, that's oftentimes what causes the mixed outcomes that we see from those strategies in the, in the educational uh, research. And what's really important as an intermediary step to increase the effectiveness of strategies is that it's really important for institutional leaders to try to do some self-assessment, really to um, explore what are the root causes uh, that, are, that are causing the, the problem that they have now become aware of. And so in this case, when we're thinking about how to diversify our faculty or how to help build um, greater inclusive practices for all of our uh, faculty, it's really important that institutional leaders do some self-assessment to understand what problems or what issues, what are the systems and structures that may not be serving uh, uh, underrepresented faculty well or, or providing pathways into those uh, faculty positions? What are the uh, structures or systems that may not be supporting those faculty in particular that lead to their attrition from the institution? Um, one of the things that we have actually created as a part of our work in the Aspire Alliance is a guidebook for institutions to, to conduct an institutional self-assessment specifically around um, this topic. Uh, and that's freely available for institutional leaders who may want to, um, to use that. It's uh, available on our project sites and in our resource page. 
And what that really does is it provides an institutions an opportunity to look at the quantitative and qualitative uh, data to really understand their institutional context so that they can then appropriately choose strategies that are more likely um, to, to uh, address the problems that they are really encountering. Uh, Jess, what do you think about that? Yeah, of course, self-assessment is, is the first step, right? We have to really look at what do we have in place, what's going on. But a lot of times the people who are conducting the self-assessment may not have firsthand experience with the challenges that, pe that women and men of color are facing in the academy, right? So they, we need to make sure too that we're also not um, assuming we understand the root cause. So if there's a policy or practice that people aren't using well on your campus. Why is that not happening? And what is the impact of that on women and men of color? And then how do they feel about it? And what do they think should be changing about the, the way the institution operates? Because sometimes uh, if we're not kind of putting ourselves in and trusting the experiences of those who tell us that this is not working for me, this is harmful to me, this is painful for me, um, this is not valuing my work, we're not likely to really understand that and then create a solution that adequately addresses those challenges and experiences. And so I think just on top of the self, part mm -hmm. of the self-assessment, the kind of deepening of the understanding is then, is then talking to people. And if you build that as part of your process, you're then also not creating a system where you're putting all of the work on your women and men of color to, to tell you what's wrong, but you're also inviting their voices in a way that is meaningful and centers those voices, right? So it's not just, oh, we checked, but then we just did what we wanted to do anyway. We really actually listened. We incorporated those suggestions and that feedback, and we've valued their contributions and their giving of their time, their emotional energy, um, their, their intellect to the work that we're doing on campus. Yeah, I really appreciate you um, kind of highlighting ways to, to bring the lived experience of um, the populations that, are, uh, that we're really trying to um, highlight here into that into that work and ways to think about valuing that contribution in a way that um, is is not just a box ticking kind of exercise but really informs the work um, and uh, acknowledges the time effort energy that that takes from those scholars um, it's also reminds me that um, if if you're working at a predominantly white institution and especially if you're working in a field that has um, that doesn't have a lot of um, diverse faculty already in it, that you may also want to think about uh, a structure to leverage those voices that provides a measure of anonymity, a leisure of protection for those faculty as well. Because, um, you know, if, if there's only one faculty of color in an entire uh, uh, department, uh, you, you know, they, they may, for very good reason, be reticent to share their lived experience. And so thinking through how an institutional leader can, can leverage that information and, and um, from them is also really important. If I could add one thing, I think um, when leaders take the opportunity to educate themselves before they go to their faculty, it can be really meaningful and really powerful. So um, to not respond as though it's the first time you've heard something when um, a woman or a man of color shares what their experience looks like, that you understand and see it as situated in decades now of literature that says that these faculty members experience the academy in a, in a very different way, but in a way that seems relatively consistent from study to study can feel validating and like you've actually done your homework and you've come to the conversation prepared to take things to the next level, that you're not there to just hear the same stories over and over again, that you're here to actually try to address what the problem is. Yeah, I think that's so important, Kimberly. I mean, this is certainly one of those situations where we say like Google, Google Scholar is your friend. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, especially in today's context, there's so much readily available, great information um, about the experience of scholars of color in the academy. There's Twitter handles, there's, you know, hashtags that, that really provide great sources of information for us to have readily available at our fingertips. 
Mm-hmm. And to just to plus one back, right? Kimberly's longer literature review is a really fantastic way to get familiar with those decades of research so that you can really contextualize your understanding. So yes, you can Google, but you can also read <laughs> this really fantastic research that's been done um, to kind of sit this work that's been done to synthesize this research and present it in a way that, you know, I think our, our brief is really readable, but so is a longer literature review. Yeah. It's just long. So, you know, that's this is why we have the brief. Long and really, really good. So I have a question for you two about the strategies included in the brief. So, you know, are, are there particular strategies that the research suggests are fairly generalizable uh, and that have a positive impact, um, which institutional leaders might consider? So. I guess in other words, my question is, what are the easy wins that every institutional leader should consider? Um, I can start. Um, and I, I don't know that I would classify this as an easy thing, but we see consistently across the literature that when institutional leaders take this seriously, when they go beyond just articulating that diversity is important, but align that articulation with the mission of their institution, with their strategic plan, with how they're um, thinking about their budgets, when they're thinking about hiring, when they're thinking about strategizing, that 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 commitment that they articulate is really manifested throughout the work that they do, that it is an amazing start. Um, It's kind of the necessary but not sufficient piece to making change, that institutional leadership really needs to go beyond saying diversity is important um, to showing that they think diversity is important through their priorities, through their actions, and through how they spend their money and resources. I think that's so important. And I think in addition, right, so with that necessary but not sufficient, there are also some kind of mindsets that we can bring into designing programs and interventions that I think can be really helpful. So if we're thinking about recruitment, right, we know the literature tells us that Uh, women and men of color faculty applicants um, will often look, expect that they be 100% matched, say, for a job description. And so even when we're just thinking about we want to rewrite or reconsider how we write a job ad, um, you know, we're thinking about where it goes and lots of other things as well, but the language in the ad is just as important and not just that statement that says we welcome people from, you know, whatever your language is for your institution that says come one, come all, but to really think about are we trying to replace somebody Um, who is really specific and has a really specific career history and therefore we're writing their history into this document and so nobody else could possibly replicate that? Or are we saying we're really open to a diversity of scholars, a diversity of uh, takes within a discipline, you know, avenues of research um, and really thinking openly. And I think kind of uh, rethinking some of those basic assumptions about what we're trying to do when we engage in a hire, like that's a, that's a key strategy as well as, of just saying, let's not, um, let's not try to replace who left, let's try to add to what we have now, right? Um, and then in terms of once people are on campus, I think thinking about what we know works in terms of supporting folks, it's mentoring. Um, and a lot of institutions will try to implement, you know, a formal mentoring program. And I think that's great, right? I mean, you need to know that you have the person to go to because the first day you step foot on campus, you may not know anybody, right? So that, that formal process is really helpful. But if you're creating a formal process, you'd also want to really think about how are you creating multiple touch points and multiple mentors. Mentors cannot be, you don't have one mentor in your life, you should have a whole variety of mentors who are helping you work along different things. You might have a mentor who's, you know, a specialist in a similar research area. So they're really going to help you with your research development. You might have someone who's a fantastic teacher and is going to help you with teaching. Um, You may want somebody that's not in your discipline at all, but maybe looks like you and can kind of talk to you about what does it mean to say navigate the academy as a black woman? What does it mean to navigate um, this, this town, right, this community. So I think making sure that you're creating a network of folks, and, and that's important both for the different fonts of knowledge that mentors can bring to a mentee, but then also is important for kind of blunting or softening any kind of advice that may be outdated or not in line with your current institutional priorities. I mean, just give someone multiple sources to kind of say, this happened, was this 
was this right? Was this crazy? Was this, am I, am I, am I imagining this? Which is all things we know that, that uh, women and men of color experience where they're like, is this normal here? Am I abnormal? Who's, what's normal here? And why, why am I feeling so torn about this? Right. And that uncertainty really adds to a lot of the struggle that folks face day to day. So a broader, um, a broader group of mentors, including peer mentors can be really helpful in, in kind of doing that. So if people were to implement one strategy, I would say that would be something to try to think through how do we do mentoring and how do we do it differently. One more point on the mentoring I would say is you should also be thinking about training your mentors. So how are you supporting them to do this work? Because if you just kind of put two people in a room together, they may not know where to start, right? And they may not know um, what to focus on and how to move forward. And especially cross-cultural mentoring training is really important. So Final thoughts on the mentoring, though I am not the expert in this room on the mentoring that would be Dr. Griffin. <laughs> and I'm going to add one more add to your thing, um, Jess, and it's very um, straightforward, although again, not simple, that as we think about um, matching and, and making sure that people have mentors, that it's just really important to the point that y'all made earlier we have to talk to people about what they need rather than just making assumptions and making matches and saying like, well, you know, new faculty members need these things. So we have faculty available to support those things that to the extent that you're in communication and in relationship with your faculty members and really digging into understanding what do, does this particular woman faculty member need? What does this particular woman of color need? What does this particular man of color need? And how can you help them then get that need met? That's essentially, to me, a successful mentoring relationship. They are not going to look the same. There's no one size fits all solution. Yeah, and I think that this is a classic case as well of thinking about like what we're describing that, you know, um, underrepresented faculty need is exactly what every faculty member needs, but it's oftentimes that our current institutional processes and structures don't actually provide that equitably to our underrepresented colleagues, uh, our colleagues of, uh, you know, or women and colleagues of color. So, um, you know, so important to kind of ask, as Kim really is saying, about what those needs are, because sometimes we don't understand where the deficiencies are in our own campuses. Um, and so that, that gives credence there. The, the other really interesting thing that this conversation reminds me of is some of the work that the three of us have done around thinking about uh, communities of support and how essential those are, especially for um, uh, scholars of color, uh, in particular uh, be because sometimes there isn't as much kind of critical mass, there isn't as much structural diversity at a campus um, or in a department. And so being able to connect, um, encouraging faculty, underrepresented faculty, um, to plug into these networks that might be broader, whether they're field specific or multi-institutional, um, encouraging faculty that those resources are out there, helping faculty, underrepresented faculty find those, and for institutional uh, structures to actually value their participation. Um, we did a quick landscape, uh, we've been doing some landscape surveys around these communities of support, and it's been amazing to see how many formal and informal networks really exist um, everything from um, mommies who math on a, a, having a Facebook group or, um, you know, scholars, women, black women of color in specific, um, uh, dis uh, specific, specific STEM disciplines. Um, those, those networks are so important um, for, for different scholars to be able to plug into. Um, and again, that to repeat myself, but you know that not only for them, but also the institutional valuing of those networks and the time spent in those spaces and not seeing those as um, detracting from research or teaching, right? That those are essential to the development um, for all faculty. So as institutional leaders engage in this work, why does it help to work collaboratively? And how can leaders think creatively about creating and engaging in collaborative organizational change work? This question makes me think about institutional collaborations, like internal institutional collaborations um, first. So, you know, particularly at the institutions that we're often working at and working with, big research universities, 
they're often very decentralized. Um, each unit is doing its own thing. And oftentimes there are lots of different folks who are trying to work on these problems, but very separately. So we might have very similar um, forms of support or resources. There might be a mentoring program in one department that's very similar to a, a mentoring program in another department, or there may be lots of different individuals who are trying to work with um, search committees and help them think about how they review their, their files differently or, how, or offer implicit bias training. To the extent that individuals really can come together and work collaboratively, so to the extent that folks can reach out to individuals working in advanced programs, reach out to individuals that um, might be working with other grants from other organizations to start thinking about how do we pool our resources rather than split them and think about providing more centralized resources that can be shared, I think we'll get a lot further. Um, also, that was mentioned earlier that in many cases, um, faculty who are from underrepresented, underserved backgrounds might be the only in their department or in their program. It feels a lot less lonely if you're able to connect to other people that are in other departments and other programs on your campus. So figuring out, you know, particularly as we're starting to think about communities of support, how do we connect people across the campus rather than just always thinking about our college or our unit can be really um, helpful ways of, of thinking and strategizing. And I think the, the corollary to that is um, in, in thinking about um, uh, external to the institution, there are some, I think, opportunities as well for institutions to, to work collaboratively with other institutions. And I think that we are, you know, currently in a, in a space where there are a lot of opportunities actually for institutions to work with one another and with some, within some national initiatives. Um, so, um, uh, there are certainly um, several initiatives that have been kind of anchored in some higher education or, uh, organizations. Um, APLU has done some of this work, but even our colleagues like um, AAU and ASCU, uh, both of these other higher ed associations have launched projects specifically to think about how institutions might work together um, to affect change in their curriculum or in different spaces. Um, Within our project, I think our project is actually a really great example of that. Within the Aspire Alliance, um, we actually have uh, about 40 coordinators coming together in six teams across six different organizations to really, um, and if, in fact, it's more than that, it's more than six organizations, um, to, to really affect change in a, in a systems approach. Um, and so I change the institutional change initiative is one of three change initiatives within Aspire that seeks to help institutions do collaborative change. So we take annual cohorts of institutions into our project where we specifically help them um, kind of structure and, and go through a, a systemic process to catalyze institutional change to build a more inclusive and diverse STEM faculty and I think the benefit to that network approach is that um, institutional teams um, are going through that kind of lockstep process uh, with one another. And so um, they can borrow on the lessons learned. Um, oftentimes institutions are trying to implement similar strategies in our cohorts. And if not in our cohorts across the network, we now have multiple cohorts um, who have you know, kind of going through this process. So this enables kind of peer mentorship of institutions. Uh, it enables these campus teams who sometimes may feel like, you know, they're the only people on their campus really kind of work doing some of this hard work to connect with other people in similar positions, facing similar challenges, trying to affect change in these complex large organizations. And that, um, that is actually one of the things that the institutional change literature shows is most effective to sustaining and achieving institutional change. Um, so there, I think, are opportunities for institutions to join with one another um, to, to engage in these processes. And I think one of the other benefits from this process is that when institutions are working together in these pretty high profile projects, you know, Aspire's uh, a five-year, currently five-year five -year funded um, grant from the National Science Foundation, that also provides a lot of um, impetus and spotlight 
um, and, and coverage for institutional leaders um, who may be in certain state contexts where they may find doing this work to be somewhat challenging and they may be feeling press from multiple spaces. Their students, their faculty, their alumni may be pressing for their institution to grow and evolve and they may feel some affordability and some um, appropriations pressures from, from other entities. Uh, and so being a part of these processes can help them take this work on in really effective, really meaningful ways um, that can help them advance this work. Um, and the final thing I would add with that is that when you're doing this work in a collaborative, um, you know, it's very common that leadership will change during, you know, this work as, as Kimberly and Jess have already pointed out, you know, this work takes time. It's not uh, we're going to become an inclusive organization in the next three years or in our next five years strategic cycle, right? This takes sustained commitment. And so um, when, when that commitment is anchored into a few, a small handful of people or a leader, um, when natural turnover and change transition occurs, that work can kind of fall away. And so really embedding this work in a strategic mission as a part of a, a larger kind of initiative can help sustain um, those efforts through leadership transitions. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that, and it's not kind of started that as a but, but it's not, uh, is, is thinking about the, the power to of what a, a network or a collaboration, a community of, of universities can do if they start to change some of the value propositions together, right? Mm -hmm. Because we are an interconnected system. We actually have also a recent report about kind of the ways that the values of our, of our broader STEM enterprise are kind of in some ways holding us back because we try to make change at the local level or at the individual level. And then we hope that this is gonna make broad reaching change across all of our universities and we're interconnected. We hire folks who are trained at other institutions, people move in their faculty roles. And so if we don't kind of start talking together as a community about what does it mean when we get external reviewers? What does it mean um, to have, you know, if the, journal, the whole journal and publication system come under question? What might it mean to have kind of the way grants are awarded coming under question as well, where we know that we're all interconnected and our values are showing up in the choices we make, the people we value, the CVs we value. And if we, if we can, as a community, come together and say, we want to push back on some of these spaces or we're going to try something different. And if we all try that different thing together, if we value something a little different, if we de-emphasize, say, institutional prestige and emphasize inclusion and diversity and commitments to that, what, what differences can we make? And if we take those risks together, perhaps it's less risky, right, than just one institution jumping off the cliff, right? And we can't always wait for Harvard to do something for the rest of us to get it done, right? We, we need to be able to, to experiment. And for some of us, doing that in a community might be really valuable. And so I think that's the other proposition of a community. It's like, let's do this internal work together, but also how can we work together to push back and make some change in this broader system that we're all part of. My only concluding thought is that um, that it's really important to seize this moment, that um, this is such a critical time um, and that I would encourage institutions to not allow other things to kind of get in the way of their commitments to diversity, equity, and inclusion. That if we've seen anything um, be true consistently across institutions, um, as they manage COVID-19 is that um, it in many ways becomes a magnifying glass and a spotlight mm -hmm. for disparities that were already there. And that if we set aside our efforts to address um, issues related to diversity, issues related to equity, because we feel like we are dealing with a crisis, that those disparities are just going to get wider and wider and wider. They're not going to go away. They're not going to be put on pause that we have to be mindful that as we're putting policies and programs in place, how do we directly address and center issues of equity? How do we continue to keep them at the forefront because they're not going anywhere? And in fact, they are getting worse if we don't address them. There's a real um, opportunity here for institutional leaders to engage their communities on campus to become a part of this and to listen because I, 
say increasing the diversity of the faculty body has been on, I think, student lists of demands uh, for the last decade, right? Um, whenever we kind of turn our national attention to issues of, um, you know, racism and, uh, and state violence, right? We end up getting this list that says, let's have more diverse faculty. So we know that this is something people are asking for and that they want, and yet we still haven't figured out how to do it. Um, and we haven't figured out how to sustain our commitment to doing that. And so I think um, this is an opportunity for, for institutions to really think about that. And I also would encourage institutions to really think about what can they do that doesn't require a massive influx of external funds, right? We know that if we depend on an external grant to get something done, we're often not building a sustainability plan for that initiative or that set of work. And so when the grant period's over, we, we move on. So how do we build this in deeply and kind of say this, this is where, you know, appropriated dollars go, not just external funds go and, and really sustain our commitment to this work and not just hope that we'll find another external body to help us support us in doing this. Well, thank you both for taking the time to chat today in our, our little group conversation. Um, for those uh, listening or watching along, I hope you'll take an opportunity to check out our brief. And uh, if you are interested, you might then further uh, take a deeper dive into the original handbook chapter um, that the, the brief, brief really came from. And you can find out more about the Aspire Alliance by visiting www.aspirealliance.org, uh, where you, there's information about our uh, projects, uh, multiple change initiatives, and in, more information about the institutional change initiative as well.